And hopefully, you know, the longer we serve him, hopefully the sweeter we get. Right. Uh, hopefully the, the better our attitude gets. And, you know, we're, we're Christians. We don't sin. We're not sinless, but we should sin less. Right. You know, we should uh, prayerfully and hopefully grow closer to the Lord, serving him better, serving him more, growing more faithful as, as time passes. And, and that's what I want to do. That's where I want to be. And uh, I've been looking forward to tonight. Um, we're sorry for the uh, events that, that led to last night not being able to be here. But the Lord knew all about that. Nothing's taken him by surprise. Nothing's right. uh, got him worried tonight. Nothing had him worried last night. So Amen. We just want to trust him. We want to follow through. And, uh, and just be faithful. Whatever, whatever he calls us to do. Uh, turn to the book of Obadiah tonight, if you will. Our first couple of messages this week... Um, you know, strictly you could say dealt with our relationship with the Lord and tonight this message is going to be more of a focus on our relationship with each other and our relationship with people and I trust and hope this will be a blessing and a challenge to you tonight. The book of Obadiah if you would and we'll begin with verse 10. Obadiah verse number 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. For thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. This was the worst thing that had happened to the children of Judah yet right. in their history. Uh, as the armies of Nebuchadnezzar had come to Jerusalem, they were burning the city and they were taking the goods from the temple before they would torch it. They found that their path to freedom, their path when they tried to flee the destruction of the city, that path was cut off. But it wasn't cut off by the chariots of Babylon. Standing in their way was their brother. Edom. Mm. The Bible says they stood in the crossway, not letting them pass, and ultimately even turned them over to the enemy. And I hope that this tonight could be a challenge to us because there are times we may find ourselves or those that are around us in a similar situation. There's literally a crossways, and there's an opportunity there, and we have to make the, the commitment and the faithful decision of whether or not we're going to help or whether or not we're going to hurt right. this situation. Our message tonight, standing in the crossways. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to come tonight. I pray that you would help us to look at our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to look at our church. Help us to look at those that are around us, uh, Lord, in the faithful eyes of compassion and righteousness. And help us to be um, duty-bound and determined, Lord, to, to do right, uh, not just for you and by you, but Lord, do right by each other. Help us as a church to be uh, a blessing to one another. Help us to be a help, uh, not a hindrance to each other. And Lord, in the day of calamity, in the day of struggle, in the day of hurt, help us to know how to act and how to do each other right. Yes, Lord. We ask it and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number one, thy brother Jacob. Thy brother Jacob. Turn to the book of Numbers chapter 20 if you would. <laughs> Numbers chapter 20. Israel and Edom don't exactly have the best past. Now if you don't know uh, who the Edomites are, they are the descendants of Esau. So when we talk about Israel and Edom, we're talking about family. We're talking about uh, you know, brothers in the past and their descendants. In the book of Numbers chapter 20, we're familiar with this story, but we're going to look at it anyway. In Numbers 20 and verse 14, Moses sent, sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, 
Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we've dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost part of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards. Neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We'll go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we've passed thy borders. Amen. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only without doing anything else go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. We look at this story and there's a lot more that really comes to mind than you could preach. You know, there, there's times that you get at odds with someone. There's times right. that you might even get at odds with a brother. But you know just as well as I do that Edom is doing this just to spite them. Right. You know, this is an unwillingness to forgive what happened years and years ago between Jacob and Esau. Well, why? Well, why is it that they, I mean, listen, human nature hasn't changed that much, right? Fighting and, and over what? I mean, something that really happened years ago? Something that they're still holding on to there? And I've seen that. I've seen that firsthand. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen it firsthand uh, in communities, schools, in churches mm -hmm. where, where folks don't like each other and they and they let it fester and it sits there and festers for years and see now and now what happens is you've got children and families and they don't like each other and you know what they don't even know why right right they don't even know why well well we just don't get along with that family why not mm -hmm. why don't you get along with them what's the problem they, they don't have any idea it's this thing that sat and festered and festered for years and years and years and now it's just like these children here, the children of Israel and the children of Edom. We just don't get along. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 23, it says this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, and in verse number 7 it says, Thou shalt not abhor the Edomite, for he is thy brother. But what about what they did to us? I mean, come on. Now that, that, was, that was really a, a jerk move. Moses promised. He said, we just want to go through. We're going to go by the king's highway. We're going to take the straightest shot possible. The most that you can imagine us doing is our cattle taking a drink of water. If we do that, we'll pay for it. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to occupy your land. We're going through. Just It would be easier for us if we could take this route and go through. No. You're not coming through our land. But, but we're just, I, I told you, we're not going to do anything. We're going to go a straight shot. We just want to get home. We just want to get where we're going. And it says that the king of Edom came out with a strong arm mm -hmm. and blocked the way so that they couldn't go and threatened to go to war with them. Over what? Walking through their land? A short passage? And then God comes to them, and in Deuteronomy he says, You don't abhor the Edomite. Even after that. Well, what about what they did to us? You don't abhor the Edomite. Mm -hmm. but, but we have every reason in the world to, and they are the ones that have always done us wrong. You're right. You don't abhor the Edomite. Amen. He's thy brother. Turn to 1 John in chapter 4. It says it in basically as strong a statement that you can say on the subject. In 1 John chapter 4. And in verse 20. If a man say I love God and hateth his brother. He's a liar. Amen. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen. How can he love God whom he hath not seen? Right. This is the command, and this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Whosoever believeth that Jesus 
is the Christ is born of God. Amen. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that's begotten of him. You can't love the one that begat us as sinners and not love the others that are begotten of him. Amen. Amen. It's, it's, not, it's not possible. Okay? I, it's hard. It's hard to get along with each other sometimes. We've got strong personalities. Uh, maybe even in this room tonight. I know some of you, I know some of you maybe do fairly well. Uh, strong personalities. Mm -hmm. There's going to be times you, you're, you're, uh, you're going to find it hard pressed to get along with each other. You're going to get upset. You're going to get angry. The Bible says, he that loveth, or he that says, I love God but doesn't love his brother. He says, he's, he's lying. Right. He's a liar. Right. We got some strong personalities. We've got men and women of all different kinds of makeup here. What's the Lord tell us to do? Do right by each other. Mm -hmm. Amen. You don't abhor the Edomite. He's done you wrong, and he's done you wrong badly. And the Lord says, You're not going to do him the same way. You're not going to do him the same way. Edom should be careful, right? Because some people do things just to spite each other. This trip would have been a lot easier if Israel could have gone through their land. They weren't being asked to help. They just want to go through Edom without, you know, the people getting all worked up. Moses even asked for permission. Mm -hmm. But Edom's bitterness continued for hundreds of years. And now we come to the book of Obadiah, where we've read in our text. And now Israel's in real trouble. The Jews in Jerusalem are trying to get out as the city is being destroyed. And as they make their way down the path to try and get out of the city and get out of their land, what's the Bible say? Their path was cut off. Right. Their way was blocked by the Edomites. The children of Edom, it says there in verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates. It says in verse number 13 and 14, or verse 14 specifically, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. Amen. You blocked their way out. Number one, thy brother Jacob. Number two, thy brother's affliction. Thy brother's affliction. In verse 12, we we're seeing here that captive forces came against the Jews. The worst thing that's happened to them in hundreds of years. And we're going to notice three things here in verse number 12. These are important to note as we consider, you know, we're looking at each other. You're looking at members of your church. You're looking at friends. You're looking at family. You're looking at other Christian brothers and sisters that, that are at a crossroads, at a path where they need help, where they need out. And the Bible says that the Edomites did three things. Look at verse 12. First of all, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. What's the first thing it says that they did? The first thing that God's mad at him about is says, you looked. You looked. Now verse 11 tells us clearly where they were. They were on the other side. Verse 11, the day that thou stoodest on the other side. What's that mean? That means they were close enough to see what was going on close enough to help and wouldn't help. Right. And the Lord's upset. Now, why is the Lord upset? He says, if you weren't going to help, why'd you have to look? Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets down to the nitty gritty, where it hurts us as people to admit who we truly are. If, if I'm not going to help, why do I have to look? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to watch? Why do I have to see? Why do I always have to be in the know? Now that's how we are, right? We're people. We want to see. We want the details. When there's juicy gossip to be had, when there's somebody that's going through trouble and struggle and trial, we want to see and we want to know. We want the details. We want to be someone that's in the know about what happened. Here's the question. Who wants to help? Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's see. You shouldn't have looked. Why shouldn't you have looked? Because... You weren't going to help. I find people's stupidity fascinating. <laughs> I see all the time now stories uh, on the news. Bad things going on. Sometimes it's even a crime. And there's somebody without a doubt going to be there. 
<laughs> with a camera <laughs> on their phone, their videotape, crimes, bad things happening. There they are videotaped. I'm sitting there thinking, it's a phone, moron. <laughs> right? Call somebody. Call the police. Call somebody's parent. Call, call somebody. We are so silly. Mm -hmm. He says, if you weren't going to help, you shouldn't have looked. That's a challenge for us as people that like to be aware. And we like to know when somebody's in trouble, when somebody's going through something, we like to know about it. If you're not going to help, do you need to know? Right. If you don't have an earnest desire to get involved and to try to be a blessing and try to help, do you need to know about everybody's struggles? Do you need to be in the know? Do you have to plaster it on Facebook? Do you have to call everyone and get the news? Do you have to call everyone and share the news that you get? Right. He says, neither shouldest thou have looked. He's not even yet talking about the things they did. He's saying, you shouldn't have looked if you weren't going to help. They looked. Look at verse 12 again. It says, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Not only did they look, the Bible says they rejoiced. That is an awful verse. Do you rejoice when bad things happen? I, there's a point at this where I usually look, maybe even at my kids, and other kids usually for some in the congregation, because they can't hide it, right? It's on their faces. If I were to look at kids, you know, look at these young people here. Do you like it when your brother gets in trouble? Paul, oh, see the grin? <laughs> You like it when your sister gets in trouble? <laughs> they can't hide the honesty, right? They grin because they can't hide it. Right. Do we rejoice when others fall? Mm -hmm. Do we rejoice in wrong, and in hurt, and in error? In the book of Proverbs, we're all familiar with this verse, but it bears repeating. In Proverbs chapter 24, And in verse 17, it says, Rejoice not when thy enemy falleth. Amen. And let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it to displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now the implication is they're turning it from him to you. Amen. Now, if you're not supposed to hate, you know, if you're not supposed to rejoice when your enemy falls, we really shouldn't be glad when each other falls. We really shouldn't be glad and rejoice uh, when we see struggles in your church and in my church and in our families and in our homes. But they rejoiced. The Lord says, first thing you did, you looked. And then only did you look, you rejoiced. You were happy about it. You were glad to see their struggle. There's four words in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that tells you one of the basics that we need to learn about love. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Amen. Love, true, godly Christian charity is never happy when there's wrong. It never rejoices when there's hurt, when there's error, when there's wrong. Love never rejoices in iniquity. Edom did. Look at, look at uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm 137. <clears throat> Psalm 137. And in verse number 7, it says this, Psalm 137, verse 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom and the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. The children of Edom, not only were they watching, not only were they glad to see it, they were cheering them on. Yeah, raise it, tear it up, burn that city down, destroy Jerusalem. And here sits Edom on the mountainsides, sit around, gawking. And watching and happy and rejoicing and cheering on the Babylonians as they destroyed their brother Israel. They rejoiced over it. Love never rejoices in iniquity. Right. We've got to learn that. We have got to learn that someone else's calamity, that someone else's fall, that someone else's hurt, error, um, pain, struggle, fill in the blank. That is not our time to come on the scene with a smile. 
right. and enjoy someone else's calamity. Amen. Shame on us for that. Amen. We, we, we are doing that way too much to each other. We're just not we're not just looking at each other's problems. We're all sometimes we act like we're glad each other has them. Right. We gotta get over that. We've got to be bigger and better than that. Amen. Than looking at each other's problems and, and having that sheepish grin that they can't hide. I'm old enough to know how to hide it. Mm. But if I'm honest, there have been times, you know what? I, I can't hide that it's in here. And I've looked at people wrong. And I've been led at some faults before. And I, I gotta do better than that. I cannot be that way. Amen. Obadiah, verse number 12. Here's the third thing they did. You shouldn't have looked. He says, you shouldn't have rejoiced. And the last part of verse number 12, he says, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. They spoke proudly. In verse number 3 it says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, Amen. thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? We all know about Edom, right? You all know about the city of Petra and the city that is that literally carved into the rocks. A, a fortress that they thought was it just unattainable, never could be defeated. They made their homes in the heights and in the mountains. And Petra, the capital city here of these Edomites, they believed that they were unstoppable. That will never happen to us. And as they sat on the side, as they sat watching the Israelites struggle, watching the Jews have their city and their homes destroyed, they said, the Lord says, you should have spoke proudly. Amen. You should not have looked on them the way that you did and said, huh, that would never happen to me. That, uh, that would never happen to the Edomites. We're, we're high. We're mighty. We have, we have such strong walls. We have such great defenses. That could never happen to us. Whereas the Apostle Paul, as he looks at folks, and his command was this in, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. The two words that he says are considering thyself. Mm, amen. When someone's overtaken in a fault, what's the two words that Paul says to us? Considering thyself. Amen. That's a large bit difference than what the Edomites were doing. Mm. Don't be proud. Don't, don't be proud. If, if Peter, David, Solomon... The list goes on. If great men of God can fall, you look up here at me. Is is there is there anybody is there anything about me that looks like I can keep my home from falling? If it's not by God's grace, Amen. He doesn't protect us and keep us safe. Do you, does there any? Does it look like there's anything about me that is strong enough to keep this thing going? That's strong enough to keep myself or any of my family or my children from from hurt, from error. From heart, is there anything about me that's able to do that? No, absolutely not. Amen. There's a total reliance and a dependence there on the grace of God Amen. to keep me and to keep them and to, to, to bless and to help. And when there is hurt, when there is wrong, when there is error, for it is working on each of us to get us back to where we need to be. There's no talking proudly. There's no looking at each other like, I would have never fallen into that. That never happened in my family. That never happened in my church. Neither should have, you shouldn't have looked, you shouldn't have rejoiced, and you shouldn't have spoke proudly. Amen. There's not a one of us that's beyond heaven trouble. Amen. And hurt. And ill things in our homes, in our lives, in our churches. Not a one of us should be proud. We You're should right. never be arrogant um, that, that any of those things are above us. So those are the things that you want to avoid. You get to, you're looking at someone in their situation. Are you going to help or are you going to stand in the crossway? Are you going to be a blessing or are you going to try to help someone? If not, don't look, don't rejoice, and don't get proud. Okay? If you're not going to help, it's, it's probably just a good idea to turn around on the mountainside and just head back home. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make a concerted attempt to be a help and a blessing in someone's day of trouble. You don't have to watch and rejoice and be proud. Right.
Number three, thy brother's need. Jacob needed help. But Edom took advantage of the situation. Look at verse 13. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance. Edom took advantage of the situation. Right. He didn't just sit on the mountainsides and look and rejoice and get proud about it. When it came time for it to benefit him, he let it benefit him too. Mm -hmm. He went in and laid hands on their substance. And again, we learn that someone's weakness or calamity or falling is never the place for me to come on the scene for personal benefit. I don't want to be like Edom. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 35, under this third point, I'd like to give three things that we can do here as we look that our desire is to not be like Edom. Not be like Edom. The first thing, and in light of the message from Monday, we'll look at this same point in light of how we look at each other. Let some things go. Mm -hmm. Let some things go. Look here in Ezekiel 35 and verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it. And say, and Mount Seir, by the way, are the Edomites. Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee. And I'll stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I'll lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword, in the time of their calamity, and the time that their iniquity had an end. Amen. You know what he says there in verse 5? He says, that Mount Seir, the Edomites, the sons of Esau, he says, you had a perpetual hatred. Now, depending on how you date the events of uh, Obadiah, if it's, the, if it's truly the last destruction of Jerusalem around 586 B.C., you are talking about almost a thousand years mm -hmm. since what happened between Jacob and Esau. Almost a thousand years ago. And you know what God says? He says, you've hated him ever since. Mm. A perpetual hatred. Right. The Lord says, you, you've held this thing for a thousand years. And because of you have a perpetual hatred, he says there, he, he holds them responsible. He says, you shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword and the time of their calamity. You know, not being able to let that thing go. You know what's sad? Jacob and Esau seem like they made amends. Mm -hmm. Jacob and Esau looks like in that scenario there in chapter 33 of Genesis, looks like they meet back up each with each other. They hug, they kiss. Seems like at least in a, in a small sense, they've worked things out. Right. And that's what happens a lot of times with us. Is that a lot of times that, that ugliness in us and that bitterness, that anger, and that frustration with each other, it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And others see it in us. And now my kids don't like your kids because I don't like you. Right. Well, guess what? What happens when you and I make up, but our kids still hate each other? Right. What happens when they don't see behind closed doors my call and my apology to you to try and make things right and try to make amends and mend some fences and help and get back on a good spot with you? What happens when they don't see that and they still carry on that perpetual hatred? It's exactly what happened with Eden. It's exactly what happened with those children. God said, your perpetual hatred. You got to learn to let some things go. There, there's no one, no one's calamity is, is justification for you holding the grudge any longer than you've already held it. Don't block the path. I would say that secondly, don't block the path. In fact, be somebody's way of escape. Amen. In the book of Hosea chapter 2, While you're turning to Hosea 2, I'll read this verse in 1 Corinthians you're already familiar with. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Amen. Do not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. We know that God is able to make a way of escape. Would we not be able to say, shame on us, shame on us, if God's made a way of escape from somebody, and then I go stand in the middle and block it. 
and I be a hindrance, and I do what Edom did and, and stand right in the middle as they're trying to flee and as they're trying to escape and as they're trying to get to safety, stand in the way and say, hey, there's some over here trying to get away. Come get them. Come punish them some more. Come, de come get them. In the book of Hosea, chapter 2, and in verse 15, it says, I'll give her her vineyards from fence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. We all know the story of Hosea and Gomer. We all know how she abandoned Gomer and fell after her other lovers and went after them and pursued them. And now Hosea comes and literally has to buy her back. Mm -hmm. literally has to take his money, has to take his earnings and go and in his love go and get her and win her and buy her back. Amen. And you know what he says? To, he says, I'll give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. I'm going to be her door of hope. I'm going to be her way of escape. This life that she's lived, Jose says, I'm going to be her way out. Wouldn't it be a blessing of the Lord to know that maybe the Lord would use you to be somebody's way out? Amen. You look at someone and you look at their calamity, their struggle, whatever it is in their life, and you see that there's such a great need and you see that there's such a struggle there. Wouldn't it be great that the Lord may be using you to be a blessing to them and be their door of hope, be their way out, be their blessing in getting through whatever it is that they're going through? What a blessing that could be for us. What bonds, what fellowship could be built in those times that then would just be unbreakable as you would look at each other and know that in those times and in that time when I was terrible and when I was so, you know, hurt and, and, and in need, this brother right here, this sister, Amen. was my way out. Amen. And then there's a fellowship and a blessing there and a tie that would never be broken. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. Obadiah, verse 15. And I'd say this thirdly. As we think about not being like Edom. Let some things go. Don't block the path. And thirdly, remember God's great principles of sowing and reaping. Amen. Obadiah, verse 15, it says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done to thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. <laughs> remember God's great principles of sowing and reaping. I want you to remember that it will not be too long down the road until you're going to face something. And I'm going to face something. And it might be in my church. And it might be in my home. And I know this. That I'm going to want a way of escape. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to want a way to make it out safely. And I'm not going to want people to look at it mockingly. And see, when it's my home and when it's my church, when it's my family, I'm not going to want people to just want to get details and look. And I'm not going to want to hear, I told you so. And I'm not going to want someone to use it as an occasion to toot their own horn. It right. won't be long until it's me. It won't be long until it's me that's needing a way of escape and needing a way out. The day of the Lord is near. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thy own head. The great thing about God's principles of sowing and reaping are that they work both ways, right? Galatians 6. talk about sowing and reaping and in the context of Obadiah it is negative but sometimes that may be the only way that we portray it and I'm here to tell you tonight and I hope that we can end on this encouraging note that it doesn't have to be that way. Amen. Sowing and reaping is not necessarily just a negative concept because he says in Galatians 6 and verse 7 be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. Amen. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Amen. So there you have both sides of it. You see, sowing and reaping doesn't necessarily have to be negative. 
You know, but know that those are God's great principles. What a man sows, that he reaps. And he looks at the children of Edom and says, you, well, I'll remember. Right. I'll remember this day. You looked and you laughed and you rejoiced and you cheered them on and you laid hands on their substance and you cut the way out. Everything that you would think, the, the, the most horrible thing that you could do, Edom did. And it's like they kept topping themselves. Right. It's like they just kept making the situation worse and worse. If I can't make the situation any better, I just probably ought to mm -hmm. right. turn around and drive home. Mm -hmm. Edom, the longer they stayed with no intent to help, the worse they made it. Yeah. The worse they made it. So I'm going to read. So he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. When you see someone, and whatever it is, you look at your church tonight. This message is about us. It's about our relationships with each other. It's about knowing what's in what's truly in us. And knowing that my day is coming, and my day may be next. It may be your day that's next. Something in your home and in your family where there's going to be some kind of desperate need of help. And the last thing you're going to want is me. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? You're getting that phone out. And, man, did you hear? Did you hear about Brother Donald? <coughs> did you hear what's going on over there? Did you hear what's going on over at Olmstead? Come on. These are silly illustrations. Aren't they? Aren't, aren't we better than that? I think we've evidenced Amen. that we may not be. Right. And we, we just, we got to start being better than that. We've got to start, uh, we've we got to start doing right by each other. And looking at each other in the right eyes, in the eyes of love, compassion, and mercy, in righteousness. We want to do what's right. We want to be faithful to, to, to God above all and always do what's right. But your calamity and your day of trouble it's not my day to come on the scene and, and to toot my own horn and to rejoice. If I'm going to come on the scene, God help me to be a help. Amen. A blessing to you. And if you see me hurting, I ask that you come and that you help. Be a help to me. Amen. And, 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 if, and if it's something you see that maybe it's something that I've done wrong that's caused it, come, come and let me know and tell me. Tell each other. Amen. Get help to each other and, and, and get somebody out of trouble. Don't be like you. Don't be like you. Let's close. Let's pray. Father, we look at each other tonight and, and we, we love each other. We know that we love you first and if we truly love you, we will love each other. But we haven't always done each other right. And I pray, Lord, that you forgive us of that and help us. Um, Give us another opportunity, we ask. I, there's not much we can do about the past. You know, we can make some phone calls and apologize, but a lot of times the past is gone. But you can give me another opportunity to be a help and a blessing to someone. I pray that you would. And I pray that you'd help each of us, um, whose, whose ever name is called next, Lord, to suffer or, or to endure trouble and trial, whose ever name is called next to bear that burden, Lord, that you'd help the rest of us to, to love and to help and to be the blessing that we ought to be and, and not come on the scene for any rejoicing or personal gain or, or anything. Lord, if, we, if we're not going to be help, then just help us to, uh, to sit this one out. Help us to look at each other in the right eyes. Help us to look at each other in these days where, uh, where there's so little time left and there's so much to do uh, to realize, Lord, we, we need to be together and faithful about doing your work in this world. Amen. Lord, give us Give us souls to talk to about Christ. Give us folks that we can be a blessing and a help to. And, uh, and Lord, I just pray that you give us the grace and the courage to be right and to be faithful in these last days. I'm thankful for this church. I pray that we're a special blessing for the, for the rest of this meeting and for the meetings that we've had this week. Um, we want, as your churches, to get back to where we need to be. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see that some of that might start um, in our relationships with each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.